We are going to have our um, last speaker on the panel, Graham Boyd. He's got a presentation, so we're going to lower the lights a little bit. But um, Graham is going to talk to you about the numbers, which if we're going to be strategic, we need to talk about the numbers. So here we go. So I'm going to come down here so that I can actually see the screen and see what's up there. Um, here we go. So what, uh, what, what I do these days is um, uh, I, I work with Peter Lewis, um, and he, his interest uh, over the last um, several years has been to try to understand as deeply we, as we can um, why people hold the views they do about marijuana, how they can be moved, what they actually are, to, to, to try to, I don't know, bring some degree of science. I'm not sure you can really call it science because there's a sort of squishiness to it. But um, we've done a bunch of research around um, the 2010 vote in California, the Prop 19 vote. Um, we uh, did polls and focus groups and so forth. Um, we're involved in doing polling to uh, help write the laws in Colorado and Washington. Um, and then uh, most recently did polling before and after the Washington Colorado elections to try to see you know, uh, who ended up moving and why they moved. So what I'm going to try to do is talk about what I think we've learned, but, uh, but really this is with the huge caveat that um, this is a soft science. It's quite possible anything that I say today is exactly wrong and that we'll find that out um, later. Um, but I think it's still worth trying to learn um, what we can. It's sort of, you know, the scientific theory. You, fo you, you form a hypothesis, you test it, you refine it, and I think we've learned a lot. And this is going to help us win in the future. So, so I'm going to try to share some of that. So this graph is just showing um, what happened with Prop 19 over time, with um, the green line being the yes vote. And this is a pattern that has happened in a number of other marijuana-related elections, and indeed a lot of elections in general, where people will say that they're going to vote yes, and they, and they plan to vote yes, right up until sometime in October. And then the yes vote starts to decline. People start peeling off for various reasons. And so, so you see there, sort of as you head into October, we went from a generally right around 50%, a little above 50%, to dipping down into the mid-40s and, and ending up, you know, basically in that shape. So let's go, go to the next slide. That didn't happen in Washington or, um, or Colorado, so, but it kind of did. So look at the yes vote here in, Col in, I'm sorry, in Washington. So we're staying, you know, around, I think that 57 number is a little bit of an aberration. I think it was generally right at 50, 51, 52 percent. And then in October, it did dip down below 50%. And we were scared. We were very, very worried at that point. Um, but in, for reasons that I, I'll talk about, it ended up climbing back up, right? So that was different than California. Go on to Colorado, please. The next slide. And we have less data points here, but it was a sort of similar thing. At or right above 50%, dipped down to 44% in an October 15th poll which was confirmed by a couple of other things. And again, I think there was reason for everybody to feel some nervousness as we were in October in Colorado, but ended up climbing back up and finishing in exactly the same spot as Washington at 55%. Um, so why did that happen and what can we learn from it? Let's go to the next slide. So presidential turnouts. Actually, I'm going to pause here for a second before looking at this. So one of the things that I think is important about the uh, opinion dynamics in all three of these states is that r roughly a third of the voters favor legalization. They, they get it. They favor legalization. Roughly a third of the voters actually are decidedly against legalization or any kind of uh, reform of marijuana laws. And in my view, we're not going to get them. And then there's the third in the middle that really is in play, that can swing either way. And so the dynamics that, that played out with the Proposition 19 campaign, and that I'm going to get to in a little bit, the, the dynamics that played out in, in Proposition 19 were that some of the third who supports legalization ended up voting no because it wasn't the version of legalization that they wanted, right? The, the base, the pro-marijuana voters peeling off. So that's one issue that needed to be addressed. Another issue, though, is that middle third, the swing voters, there were many people who, who were 
thinking about voting yes, were tentatively planning to vote yes, and then they ended up voting no. And, and that group of people um, I'm going to describe in a little bit more detail. Um, so those, keep in mind those sort of two different groups of voters and two different dynamics that ultimately I think you need to address both of those. But before I get to that, I do want to talk briefly about the presidential turnout thing. So for sure there are people in all of the states that are thinking about legalization. Now California, but also in Oregon and some other states who are thinking, you know, we're winning now. Let's go for it. Let's do 2014. Let's win in 2014. It really makes a big difference when you run these elections because, and I, I know you've all heard this, right? When the president is up for re-election, not just whether it's Obama, but any presidential election, there is a greater turnout, especially among young voters. Older voters tend to vote every election. Younger voters, though, sometimes don't vote until it seems like a really important election, a presidential election. So. In the, the presidential, well, so this, what this graph shows is on the left-hand side were the actual results in California in 2010. So Prop 19 lost with 46% yes, 54% no. That was the final outcome. If you rework those numbers so that you, you know, recalculate them for a presidential year turnout, so the 2008 turnout, it comes out to be almost a dead heat, almost a tie in California. Now, interestingly, if you take the numbers in Washington and Colorado, so this is showing you how the turnout can change, right? So let's look just at the left-hand side here under Washington. The column of 2010, the 18 to 29-year-olds um, were 13% of the electorate in 2010. And in Washington in 2012, they were 22% of the electorate. So a big, huge plus 9% jump in youth voters in Washington, even bigger in Colorado, plus 11 percent. And so correspondingly, a decrease in the percentage of plus 65 voters. So that, you would imagine, is going to make a huge difference. So if you take the Colorado and Washington numbers, each of them won at 55 percent, right? If you recalculate those numbers for a non-presidential election, Colorado ends up basically at 50-50 at pretty much the same place Prop 19 did. Interestingly, Washington still ends up at 54% because the, the coalition of who ended up voting yes in Colorado and Washington were different. And I think there's some important lessons to be learned for what we do in California next time about ways that I think each campaign did a couple of things particularly well. And my guess is that if we're going to have a contested campaign in California in 2016 with a real opposition, we won't be able to win by doing one or the other thing right. We actually have to do both of those things right. So campaigns matter. This was the other thing that Prop 19 valiantly, valiantly fought, but, um, but had a hard time because they didn't have the budget to do a big television campaign. And it really does make a difference. Any television campaign. And, um, and Colorado and Washington, first of all, it, it takes less money to run an effective TV campaign in those states than California. Um, but both states were able to put up a pretty good number of gross ratings points, which is basically the measure of how much your television is saturating. Um, so, so there was actually a campaign, and that's, in my view, a necessary prerequisite to being able to communicate with voters. I agree with what Mason was saying about all the importance of the work you were doing beforehand to get the conversations going, but I think it's, it, it's not either or. I think you've got to do both, and I think one of the things that you've got to do is to be able to actually have a campaign that reaches people. And these two campaigns did reach people. Go to the next slide. Um, this is really interesting to me. So retired police and law enforcement types, this is from a poll that was done right after the election and people were asked, what were the faces of reform? Who, who did you think were advocating for reform? And the ads that were run most prominently in both states had, um, in, in the case of Colorado, a retired Denver police officer, and in the case of Washington, a retired DEA agent and a retired federal prosecutor. And so when people said the faces of law enforcement were retired police and law enforcement types as number one in Washington, number two in Colorado, that, they were getting that from somewhere. That means they, they saw the ads. We measured a lot about how much penetration there was in terms of people recalling the ads, remembering the ads, and so people saw and remembered the ads in both places. So now I want to get into the, into the thing of how do people end up 
supporting legalization in theory, and, and this happened with Prop 19 in California, supporting it and yet at the end of the day voting against it, so changing their minds, switching. So, so these are, are the most significant groups of people who flip-flopped, who went from planning to vote yes to ultimately voting no. So a pre-election poll is the green column. That's the percentage of this group that said they were going to vote yes. The post-election, the black bar, is how many ultimately voted yes. So you see the drop-off among young voters, drop-off among young women. So among the young voters, it's much more women than men who ended up dropping out of the yes side. Um, married women, and then also older voters, older white voters. So these are, these are groups who are defecting from yes to no. And there are also, as I think everybody in this room is very familiar with, there was a real sort of debate among people who were pro-marijuana, pro-legalization, and yet ultimately were against Proposition 19. So the no percentage of the no vote on Proposition 19, the majority of the voters of Humboldt County voted no, right? Um, and people who have friends who use marijuana, 39% voted no. People who themselves have used marijuana, 34% no. And even people who say they favor legalization, a full 15% voted no. So we knew back in 2010, as soon as we were looking at the post-election information, that this was something, th these were two things that we had to deal with, right? And the two campaigns, I think, each kind of came up with a formula for doing it. In my view, Washington, I, I think, more directly took on holding on to those swing voters, the folks from the previous slide, and, um, and, and yet also did a very good job of, of engaging the base and trying to keep them on board. Um, Colorado also did both of them, but ultimately the coalition that made up the winning um, numbers, the winning 55% in Colorado um, are different than Washington. So let, let's go to the next slide. So th th this is a little bit hard to read, so I'm going I'm to walk you through this. So just looking at Democrats, the top line there, the orange bar is the total yes vote in that group for the Colorado initiative. The pinkish, purplish bar is the same thing for the Washington initiative. So for Democrats in Colorado, 73% of the Democrats voted yes. In Washington, 76% of the Democrats voted yes. Um, so the things that really jump out for me here are, look at Republicans, right? Um, I think that um, the effort that Mason described to reach out to conservatives and to bring in Tom, Tim, Credo and all of that paid off and that you did get 26% of Republicans. That's good. But at the same time, I think the sort of overall law enforcement having, you know, the former prosecutors as, your, as the face of the campaign in Washington um, came across, I think there was a perception of it being more of an establishment, more of a mainstream, more of an even conservative campaign. And, and they got 39% of Republicans. Likewise with older voters, well, I actually skip down to the men and the women too. This is a place where you see the, the difference coming out. So um, one of the best predictors of support for legalization is how familiar you are with marijuana. Men use marijuana more than women, have more familiarity with it, and generally support legalization to a greater degree. Um, in Colorado, um, the campaign did really well with young men. Um, there wasn't, in my view, really much of a defection. The, so we talked about the Humboldt County problem in California, right? The pro-marijuana folks who ended up voting no. That really didn't happen in Colorado. So it, 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 through, I think, running a smart campaign, through the images that they were using, through the many years, as Mason described it, of engagement, there wasn't a base defection that happened in Colorado. Allison had to deal with that to a large degree, and I think was smart about trying to minimize the degree to which it happened, but there was some base defection in, in, in Washington. Um, so Colorado did better among younger men. Conversely, um, the, the, the Washington campaign did a little bit better among younger women. Um, also did a little bit better among older voters. So, I, I mean, I think it's, it's oversimplistic to sort of characterize the Washington campaign as being the more conservative one and the Colorado campaign as being the more you know, liberal or progressive or pro-marijuana, but there's, I think there's something there, and, and I think part of our work in moving forward in other states is to really 
understand at a deeper level everything that happened in each state. I will conclude very briefly to say, you know, the folks in this room are, are really, I think, the core of what I'm calling the base. You know, so as we're looking at 2016, it is going to be vitally important that we do the work of building a coalition that'll hold together. And I think the CCPR is right now the best vehicle for doing that. But at the same time, realizing, I think, that we may well have to compromise in a lot of ways so that we can get those swing voters. And so we've got to thread that needle. We've got to find a way to do both of those things at the same time. And, and, and the reason that we can't assume that we're going to win is because that middle vote is very, very fluid. It can move either way very easily. It did in California. You saw that drop off. It could do it again in California. So we can't take anything for granted here. And even when you think about those compromises, about are you going to um, allow a lot of cultivation or restrict it or not have it at all? Are you going to have the DUI or not at all? This is a very important finding from our research. The voters of Colorado and Washington were largely unaware of the provisions of those initiatives. They didn't know. Because although there was some funding for an opposition in Colorado, they didn't, for whatever reason, get the message out about what was actually in the initiative on these things. That certainly didn't happen in Washington either. So if we go forward on the assumption of, well, it worked there, we can get away with it, four years from now, we may find that there is a funded opposition, that they do their research, they know the vulnerabilities. And so when we kind of went for this reach of something we really wanted, that might be the very thing that costs us victory. Or it might not, but we need to do that research and figure it out. So stick together, build the coalition, hold on to our base, but also be real about reaching the middle of, of, of the road voters. That's the message. Thanks. Thanks a lot. This has been a really terrifically enlightening panel.